Hey there, I'm Source Make, and welcome to the Introduction to APIs video, where we are going to start a series on making our very own API. And in this video, we're going to talk about what an API actually is and what the format of it is, how it's used, stuff like that. So I've got my website open. It's got all the resources that we need for this topic, and it's going to have continuous pages to all the series that we're going to do. So this is a series. We're going to have different pages on how to make an API. The planning that goes on, you'll see what the process is at the end of this video. So go ahead and click the link below this video if you'd like to get to this page and go ahead and hit the subscribe button for this YouTube channel while you're there. So this is going to be really quick. What is an API? An API is really just a function over the internet. So you know how when you code, the reason you use a function is because it's got it's this nice reusable block that you can separate off from everything else and it's its own little thing and it it does a particular task. That's basically what an API is. Now an API is a function that exists over the internet. So somewhere on the internet there's a server for this API and the way you ask the server for the API to do the function for you is by using HTTP, which is why APIs are so prevalent. It's basically a protocol. It's, it's like a standard protocol. So HTTP is the same thing that you use for your internet, which is basically like, like uh, for, for your web browser. So this website, sourcemake.com, is over a URL, which is over the internet, which is over HTTP, the protocol, and APIs do the same thing, which is why they're so popular. It's like you get to do everything with HTTP. And that's basically what an API is. It's just a function over the internet, allows you to do some functionality. The reason people use it is like, let's say a bank has data that they wanna let people access, then they can make an API and let all their clients access it. Or maybe a team has their own app that they're making, like a banking app. Well, you need information from the customers from the database, but how do you actually get the information into the app? Well, you make an API that facilitates that transaction where you get the customer's info, it goes into the app locally on their phone or maybe the website, and that's how these things work. So APIs are used everywhere. They're really important to know, which is why we're spending time going over them. Now, that's what an API is. What does an API actually look like? Well, it's just some code over the internet based on your favorite programming language, sort of. But the way you use an API is basically by a URL, just like you would for a website. So the URL starts out with a base path, which is like google.com, for example. This is an example for Google's Maps API. And they have a base URL right here. And the base URL is google.com slash maps. And then you've got this thing called a path. Now, there are three things in the API where you specify what you want the API to do. So you've got the URL, which basically means, okay, this is going to point to the server where the API code lives. You know how that works. Hopefully, you know, right. If you don't go watch the VPN series or how the internet works series, series or not series, the videos that I did on the topics and you'll figure out how that works. But this URL points to the server that the API code lives on. And then you've got these other things in the path, which is basically set up to say what part of the API it is. Because this API server could have a bunch of different API functions. Like one could, for example, for Google Maps, one could translate an address into a coordinate, like latitude and longitude. And another one could translate latitude and longitude into an address. And maybe another one finds like the best restaurants around a certain address. The, the API could do a bunch of things, and that's why... Mostly in the path, the API specifies what the particular function is going to be. So that's the path. That's something you specify. The next thing that you use an API, like you specify in the API if you're trying to use it, is called a parameter. Now, this is the syntax for a parameter. You've got the base URL. Then you've got the path, which in this case is the search feature. Then you've got this question mark, and that starts the parameter list, if there are any. And for each parameter, you have the actual parameter name, you have an equal sign, and you have the value. And for each following parameter, you've got an and symbol, and you've got the same syntax. So let's say you had an address you wanted to give. Well, this is the base path. Then you've got the question mark to start listing parameters in the URL itself. And then you've got maybe one for address name, which could be like 12 Mulberry Lane or something like that. And symbol. Then you've got city equals let's say, I don't know, New York, 
then you've got maybe the and symbol and the state, which could be n y, and maybe then you have the and symbol one more time, and it's got the country code equals u s. And basically, it's it's just a bunch of these something equals something followed by the and sign for the parameters. Basically, it's kind of like JSON, except it's in the URL. Not JSON, but you got something equals something. And this particular item is going to be looked for in the API. So so when you go to this API, it's going to look for this and say, oh, this is part of the information that the user is trying to send. This is part of the address. And what I need to do is I need to send back the latitude and longitude for this address. So I'm going to look for each part of the information. And the way you know how to use this is because the API will specify it. You'll see in the next section how you actually look at how API documentation works. So the last thing that an API has is the response body. You can't see it in the URL, but basically there's a little bit of a body that gets sent to the API, which is also basically the same thing as a parameter. It's just got a bunch of key value pairs that equal to each other. And the reason you would use a response body instead of just a parameter is like security issues because it's not part of the URL. And the other reason is because maybe you have like some really long data, like a huge address, or maybe you're sending like a picture file to the API. And that's got like a bunch of bits in it or a video file, stuff like that. So so those would be best in a response body that's not part of this long URL because URLs do have limits. You know, URLs are part of this HTTP and they've got rules to follow. So next, we've got to talk about HTTP methods. One of the things that the HTTP specifies is called a method, and that's basically related to what the API does. Now, these are not hard rules. These are just sort of like... The develop it, it's good practice to use these. You don't have to use you have to use them, but they don't have to do what they say they do. So you've got post get put delete, post sends data to the server, get gets data from the server, put updates data from the server, and delete deletes data from the server. So this is corresponding to CRUD commands for databases: create, read, update, delete. And so so for example. If you're trying to get an address given a latitude and a longitude, that would be like a get command because you're not changing anything on the server, on the API server or a database. What you're doing is just trying to get information. It's like a query. Or maybe you're trying to update a customer information if, for your website if they, I don't know, if, if they buy something, then that might be a put operation. Or maybe you're deleting someone from your mailing list, so that's a delete operation. These aren't really hard-coded rules, but you specify these when you specify the API, when you actually use it. So, yeah, just know about that. You'll see how these get used. And finally, what does an API return? So there's two things the API returns. It returns the content in the response body, which is similar to the... No, I don't know if I said this wrong before, but there's a re request body. I should change this word. It's, it's a request body that you send to the API. The response body is what they send back to you. So if you're requesting the address, they send it back in a response body in the response body of the API. And the other thing they send is this status code. So there's a list of status codes. And it basically is part of the API and it tells you what the response is. So if it's OK, it's OK. But sometimes maybe you're not authorized to perform an operation. So that would send back a response code of 401 or 400 if there's a bad request, 409 if there's a conflict. Basically, these response codes make it easy so that there's some sort of standard for what you get back from the API. Because you know, you, you're you using this API in a program, and it's not like you're manually checking it to read what the error message is. Your program is checking it. so. Your program will get back the response code and they'll say, okay, 404 not found, I must be using the wrong API, so let me send that kind of message to the developer. Or maybe it just says unauthorized, okay, maybe our response, our like authorization key isn't working, so you got to deal with that. And response codes just basically do that. They, the API specifies what the issue is so that they can return it. And it's not just what the developer says. It's not human language like an error code, like someone typing, oh, this was the wrong address, or this address doesn't exist. Instead of saying that, you have a response code for the type of error that would happen, if there is an error.
So that's what an API is. And let's learn about how we make an API because we're going to be making an API of our own in this series. So one, you should plan what your API wants to do, obviously. And that includes the URL paths functionality of the API. Next, you create a document for the API using Swagger format. So you're making this API, but other people have to use it or even like other teammates yourself has to use it. You have to use it in the future. The best way to do that is by using this thing called Swagger and basically sneak peek Swagger makes your API look really pretty by having the paths and what the response or the request body is going to look like. If it is a body, if there's any parameters, the code responses that could get sent back, that's what Swagger is. So you make that document, everyone's happy. That's really professional. Next, you pick the programming language you want to use. So remember, this API code exists as a function on a server over the internet. So typically, people use Java and Node.js, and we're going to do both of those in this series. So yeah, just the, pick the programming language you want to code in. Next, you code the API and you test it locally. So again, your API is a function over the internet. So make sure that, you know, it just, it's, it's code. It does its task. And next, you deploy your API code on a server. So again, this is a function over the internet. It needs to be on a server so that other people can come in and access that function. It's not just supposed to be running on your computer by itself. It's got to be over the internet. And finally, you create what's called a Postman collection. And this basically just tests your API endpoint. So whatever path you have, whatever your API is supposed to do, you write a bunch of unit tests for it, and that's called the Postman collection. So we're going to be creating our very own API for the rest of this series. So go ahead and follow along. Subscribe, because that's what an API is, and we're going to be making our own. That's our motivation. So I'm Swiss Make. Thanks for watching. We'll be making an API very soon. Follow to see the next part, or see the playlist. Thanks.